All right, so let's continue our last video and talk about more music business administration stuff that audio engineers do. So if you haven't seen my last video, I talked more about the stuff that I do during like the pre-production phase as an audio engineer. So I'll put a card up on the screen so you can check that out if you want. Today, we're gonna talk more about what I tend to do during the production phase and during post-production. So with that said, this is a result of a request that was put in by a Patreon patron. So thank you so much for that request. Um, I'm not sure if I should mention your name because I don't want to violate anyone's privacy, but thank you so much for that request. I think this is a great video idea. So for me, when I talk about production as an audio engineer, it's when I'm actually doing like the core essence of what my work is. It's what people think of when they think of what the audio engineer is doing, right? So it's the actual setting up the microphones and tracking. It's the actual mixing. Sometimes it's a little bit of mastering, right? It's um, it's me doing that core stuff. And, you know, it's like collecting the information ahead of time that we talked about in the last video. That's all still work, but um, it's not really what we think of as like the core work that the audio engineer does, right? So during the production phase, I'm often very busy just doing that work, right? Setting up microphones, um, checking signal, right? Um, making sure everything's coming in well, doing the actual tracking, monitoring the levels, um, listening back, making sure it all sounds good, making sure it's the tone we want, you know, mixing stuff, adding effects, making everything balanced, getting everything in its place in the stereo field, all that stuff, right? So, with that said, this list is a lot shorter than the pre-production one. For whatever reason, it's a lot shorter, right? So um, one thing that I'll do during production is I will take notes on any microphones and preamps used, including the routing, and I will include the settings for like the preamps, for example. And so sometimes that involves, I have a notebook that I keep right here and I'll, I'll write notes. And um, sometimes that'll involve actually like drawing the knobs on the preamps and like drawing which way the line is facing on the knob, right? Um, sometimes we can't always put that information into text. Sometimes I'll do like it's at whatever o'clock, you know, like if the knobs like that, I'll be like, it's at three o'clock. Um, and a lot of times I'll put these notes in the comments section on the tracks within Pro Tools itself as well, just so it's it's in multiple places. It'll be easier for me to find it if I need the information. And I'll do that mostly so that if we want to then recall a setup, we can more easily do it. And also, you know, sometimes I'll have clients come in where it's like we figure out that one type of microphone we love on their voice, you know, and what will happen is oftentimes the preamp is set pretty similarly, you know, if it's the same singer each time coming in. Um, it can be set in a very similar way from session to session, from day to day, um, especially if their music tends to be similar genres each time, right? So uh, a lot of the times writing down something like the preamp setting and the routing and the microphone use can help me then really quickly recall that stuff. I can be like, oh, I have this session with this person again. They're going to want to sing because that's what they're doing, right? And I will go look at my notes and then set up that microphone with that setup with those preamp settings before they even come in. And then when they come in, it's just going to be minor tweaks to the preamp setting probably, um, maybe some minor tweaks to the actual setup. But I will be much closer to where we want to be. Um, than we were the very first time we did it, right? So I'll take notes on all that stuff for a variety of reasons, but it's it's very helpful to keep you working quickly and efficiently. Um, and with that said, I'll also take notes on mic placement with photos. So I have, I use Google Photos. Um, all my photos get backed up to Google Photos automatically. So it's really easy for me to then drag those photos into folders and stuff to then archive them for later reference, right? If we want to recall a setup, for example. So mic placement with photos is also very, very helpful and very important. The worst thing is when someone's like, oh, I love this setup. Can we do that exact setup again? And you have no idea how you did it, right? You don't want to ever be in that position. I don't want to ever be in that position. So I'll take notes on everything. Um, it's not the sexiest thing, but I kind of like taking notes. It's not too bad. I guess that's why I'm an engineer. I don't know. Um, another thing that I'll do is while recording, like if we're tracking, for example, I'll take notes on different takes. I'll take notes on my thoughts while recording. Like if I really love the emotional output in a take, I'll write that down. 
And then when we go to listen to all the different takes, I'll be like, I love the emotion in this one. Um, this one might have more technical precision, stuff like that. So I'll take notes on that. Um, sometimes I will link those notes to marker numbers because you can drop a marker in Pro Tools while the recording is running, um, while you're tracking. So sometimes while they're tracking, if I notice something that we should come back to, that we should take note of, um, I'll just hit enter on the numeric keyboard uh, twice really quickly and then I'll drop a marker and then I'll, I'll, I'll take a note on what that marker is. So that's another thing that you can do. And I think that's pretty much everything that comes to mind right now for production, for the production stage of things, right? It all kind of basically comes down to being very meticulous on how you document things, right? Um, and that's in case you want to recreate or modify later, right? If you know, hey, I liked how we did this setup last time, but I want it to be a little more warm sounding, you know what last time was so you can launch off from that and then change it. So just be very meticulous about documenting what you're doing. Um, it seems weird sometimes to people, but it helps. It really helps. Um, so with that said, let's shift into post-production. Okay, so what I would call post-production for the sake of this video, again, we're looking at this from the lens of like administrative business stuff that audio engineers do. Um, this is going to be very different than post-production for film, for example, right? Um, I'm just using this word to kind of describe the phases of what I do on an administrative level. So the first thing that I do is I will invoice the client, right? So I have an invoicing system. You know, it actually hasn't changed a lot over the years, my invoicing system. And I did make a video about the invoicing system a while back. It might've been years at this point, but I will find that if I can and put a card up on the screen so you can all, you can all go back and watch that if you want. It's probably pretty cringy for me to watch at this point. So I might, I probably won't watch it. I'll probably just link to it. You can check it out. But I basically just make invoices within Google Drive and then I download a PDF and send the PDF to the client. It's pretty simple. Um, I've changed it a little bit, but not a ton. Um, I have a folder where I will put paid invoices. And then I have um, outside of that folder are all my open invoices. And that's basically it. I will send the invoice to the client as soon as possible after the session has ended or after the mix is done or, you know, whatever it is. I will send the invoice and I'll often offer to send an invoice even if they don't need it necessarily or they've already paid me. Sometimes people will pay me immediately as they leave with like Venmo or something. Um, but I'll offer to send it because I'll say, hey, you know, I'm going to make this anyway for my records. Do you want it? So I do that. I always make sure that I make one. Um, and then whether or not I send it to the client kind of depends on the client. And then what I'll do is if they have not paid already when I'm sending the invoice, I'll make a note on my calendar to check like a week from then or, or you know, some, sometimes I vary it slightly. Um, but I'll, I'll make a note to check to see if they've paid it. Right. So I don't miss that that payment coming in. Um and then once they do pay it, what I'll do is I have like at, at the bottom of my invoice, I have a section where I can type in paid and it like I have it so it auto highlights it yellow. Right. So it's like big, bright in your face. This has been paid. And then I'll put a note on the date it was paid, the method of payment. And then if it's something like Venmo or Cash App or whatever, I'll put the transaction ID in there as well. And then I move that whole invoice to my paid folder. And I have paid folders based on the year. And that's for tax purposes, right? So I'll have like right now I have a 2022 paid invoices folder. Um, when it becomes 2023, I will make a folder for that year, right? That's pretty simple. Um, so that's what I'll do. I'll make a calendar note to make sure that I check that they paid. Um, and I've been pretty lucky. Most of my clients have been paying very quickly. I haven't had to like follow anyone or hound anyone for payment. So I've been very lucky recently. Um, I love all my clients now. Everyone's great. Um, so I've been very lucky with that. Sometimes when you're starting out, you have more trouble getting payment or you have, um, it's just a little, a little tougher. Um, the type of clients that you get just in general. So um, I've been very happy with that. So then the other thing that I'll do is I'll make sure people know either when I first start working with them or at some point I will mention the idea that if you want your sessions, I will give them to you. And this isn't every audio engineer. Some people like to guard their sessions, but um, I, I just see it as another means of backup, right? So I have everything backed up in multiple places on my end, but it doesn't hurt to have another backup with the client. And I also make sure that they know, hey, I have a lot of third-party plugins that 
that might not open on your computer if you have Pro Tools, right? Um, so just keep in mind, like me giving you the session doesn't necessarily mean that you'll be able to open it and have it be the same as it is here. So, um, you know, if you want something like stems printed out or if you want it exported like track outs for a different DAW or something like that, let me know because that's another thing that we will have to provide. But my default is to provide the session as is to the client because that's just as simple as doing a file transfer onto their hard drive. Um, and I don't feel the need to guard it. I don't I'm, I don't know. I don't know why some people guard it. Um, I don't feel the need to guard it. So I do offer that to all my clients. And then the other thing that I'll do at the end of any session, right, is I'll back things up. So um, whether that's a mix session or a tracking session or what have you, sometimes it's a little bit of mastering, um, I will back things up. So I have, I mentioned this in the last video too, but this is technically part of the that post-production phase, right, that ending phase. Um, so I have one of these that I work off of instead of my computer drive. So everything's on one of these already. And then I back it up to another external. And then I will back it up to Google Drive. And that's it for now. I have used things like um, Box and stuff like that as well. Um, maybe I should have it in multiple more places. I don't know. But um, right now, it's pretty much everything in three places is what I have going. So I will back up the session. I'll make sure it's fully backed up before I move on to the next thing. Um, sometimes I do that at the end of the day so it doesn't interrupt my working hours. But it kind of depends on what I'm doing, how big the session is. Some, if I know it'll just be a couple minutes, I'll just back it up and then move on to the next thing. But I do back up everything, everything that I work on. So it's really important. <laughs> you don't want to be stuck out having to tell somebody that you lost their session somehow. So I will back everything up. Um, and then the only other things that I do are kind of thinking about going forward, right? So I will find out what the client wants to do going forward, right? Am I now mixing what we just recorded, for example? Are we editing and comping? Did we already do editing and comping? Are we going to work on the mix next? Do you want me to send this to you so you can send it to someone else to work on the mix or the master? Stuff like that. Are we going to redo anything? Do we want to re-record anything? Do we want to um, rework anything? I will just communicate with the client about what they want to do going forward. You know, simple enough, right? But it's really important to make sure you're communicating about what the next step is, right? So I will do that. And then if we need to, we will schedule any future sessions, right? So sometimes that's like, hey, text me when you want to do your next session. Let me know what you're thinking. We can put something on the calendar. Um, we don't always have to schedule like right at the end of the session, right? It can be like a day later or whatever. But I make sure to mention it at the very least, right? You know, if, if, we, if we do need to make more sessions, especially scheduling sessions in person, like tracking, for example, I will make sure that I mention it and that we try to get the ball rolling on that. So yeah, that's basically it. Part two on the administrative and business side of things that I tend to do as an audio engineer. So I hope you all liked it. Let me know what you think in the comments below. As always, like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell. I'd appreciate all of that stuff. And I do have that Patreon. It's patreon.com slash Noise. And my patrons get access to additional content. We have a Discord server we're all hanging out on. We have the book club. You can put in requests for video topics just like this one. And other than that, I come out with new videos every Wednesday. And thank you so much for hanging out. Okay. So I kind of recently became an organizer for the writers around uh, San Diego. So it's like it's kind of like an open mic night, but it's more curated. It's a lot of fun if you can make it. It's every Monday night at the Old Sod if you're around and you can make it. Um, but part of that is I've been experimenting with filming the event. Right. So I've got the audio down pretty well. I think I've been pretty happy for like a live sound recording. Um, I've been pretty happy with what I've been capturing, but what I've been doing is I've just been taking this GoPro. I only have one GoPro. This is what I use for my YouTube videos. And I've been bringing that and filming. And sometimes like with the lights and everything, people look kind of washed out or it looks kind of grainy or something. So I would love recommendations on a camera that's good in low light and bonus points if I can use it for YouTube too, to some capacity, like, um, Next week, I'm, I think it's next week, I'm going to go tour a guitar company um, that's up. I think they're in like Riverside or something, Oceanside. They're near here. So I'm going to be touring that company's uh, facilities with a couple of people. And I'm going to try to film it and make a video out of it for you guys. 
Um, so if it'd be, you know, if it's a camera that would be good for something like that as well, that would be really rad. Right. Um, I, I just, whenever I go outside of the studio here, I just take the GoPro with me and that's been working pretty well, but I know a lot of people's videos look a lot better <laughs> than mine do. And, um, yeah, if anyone has any recommendations for a camera that would be good in low light for something like a concert style venue, and also um, be good for, I, I guess it's kind of like vlogging, right? But um, I'm afraid to call myself a vlogger. So <laughs> there's that. But let me know if you have any camera recomm recommendations. I would really appreciate it. Okay, I think that's it. Bye.